You're listening to the Cash Flow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner, your source for investing made easy. Here's Andy Tanner. Welcome, everyone. Andy Tanner here. Welcome to the Cash Flow Academy podcast. Uh, it's an amazing time. The recording of this podcast is on March 23rd, 2020. So we're right in the middle. We'll try to get out as soon as possible. But we've had uh, this very special guest on our podcast before. Uh, I'll take a moment and, and introduce him here in a bit. But we have the father of the 401k, uh, Ted Bennett, joining us on the podcast. I'm in your debt, sir. It's great to hear your voice again. Thanks for coming, Ted. Hey, Andy. Uh, well, I uh, usually look forward to interviews, but I'm not so sure today with what's going on. <laughs> but uh, appreciate the opportunity. Al. Thanks much. So. Th- the first thing I know about Ted is, um, you know, I interviewed you about it uh, not quite a year ago. It was, it was coming into the fall of the 40th anniversary of the 401k, and it was the first time we had a chance to meet. And I just found you uh, to be as uh, delightful as a person that, that you could speak to. And, uh, and I first question I have for you is, hey, are you okay? Are you healthy? Uh, your wife, Ellie, is she okay? Is everything good? Yeah, fortunately, Andy, at this stage, we're in uh, North Central PA, and you know, right now, things are uh, pretty normal health-wise in this area so far, but you know, it's uh, pushing this way, though. Well, it, it's, it, it's going to be coming. So I'm going to take a moment. I, I imagine most of my listeners know who you are. They follow us really closely, and they've heard our previous interview. For anyone that's new, though, I'm going to take just a moment and give them a little bit of your background so they know who you are. I hate having to introduce myself, and I like when people, other people do it because I don't like talking about myself very much. I know you're the same. So Ted Bennett has had an influence in, in, in almost everyone's life, even around the globe. Uh, Ted Bennett is called the father of the 401k because he actually created the very, very first uh, 401k retirement account. He is the person that took the legislation and put it into this idea of doing this. So uh, way back uh, January 1st, I believe, 1980, uh, you did this with your own firm. We're going to talk about more of the creation of this, but let's fa- we'll, we'll have plenty of time for that. Let's fast forward to today, Ted, and... Uh, the last time we spoke on our podcast, you made a prof- what I think is going to be a prophetic statement. We're going to have a chance to talk about all the times you've been taken out of context, uh, you know, particularly in the book. I-, I loved where you talked about the interview where all of a sudden everyone said you wanted to blow this up and it was a little out of context. So we're going to clarify some of those misquotations. But, you know, one of the things that bothered both you and I is the fee structures, um, you know, what Wall Street has done with this in terms of its marketing and, and, and so forth. And I asked you this question about 401k. So we'll begin here. I said, uh, Ted, was this designed to shoulder the entire burden of retirement or was it, uh, you know, just kind of designed to improve upon pensions and be supplemental? And then I said this, you know, you're an actuary. That's your background. And I know you look into the future. And I said, you know, if people that are age, you know, 55, 60, 65, our market was pretty high. It was an all-time high when we spoke last. And I said, you know, I, I see a lot of storm clouds out there, a lot of pressures. Wouldn't take much to trigger this to topple. And then you said, Andy, I've been running numbers on this. And I said, for someone who isn't kind of prepared for this, it's not, you said, well, this is the words you said, Andy, it's not going to be a pretty picture. And it turns out today that I think you may have been prophetic. uh, And here we are exactly where you, I mean, with less than a year ago, this is exactly where you said uh, we might be. Can you talk about what you were thinking, you know, in more detail? You probably didn't think coronavirus, but you did see a market that could tumble. Talk a little bit about what an actuary is, because that's your background and then just tell me your feelings about today, because you you actually called this on my last podcast. Uh, yeah, hey, well, and hey, just to correct a little bit here, I t- I took one actuarial exam, <laughs> and, and after that, and and I decided, hey, I would rather hire actuaries than be one. <laughs> oh yeah, you did, but I remember you called, and I I don't think I think you're too <laughs> self deprecating. You're like. Andy, I was an actuarial grunt. You're not a grunt, Ted. <laughs> yeah, well, I was an actuarial grunt. That was my first job. But, uh, you, you know, after one exam, I uh, that was my uh, you were done. answer response on that one. But, yeah, I mean, as far as uh, kind of being on the money here right now with this thing, uh, 
unfortunately, uh, we're, we're not even there yet. Uh, it's it's going to get a whole lot worse as far as the retirement situation is concerned. But, you, you, you know, you, you need to be that smart. I mean, uh, I, I was a math major, and I tend to think logically. So my background is in finance. You know, we, we've always, as you well know, Andy, have had, you know, bear and bowl markets. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, and, uh, you know, I, uh, this cycle and the last cycle, although f- people have expected somehow or other we had to learn how to avoid that, I uh, knew we hadn't, you know, as history repeats. Yes. And my concern was that the fact that when we went into the next one, whenever it hit, we were in much worse financial condition mm-hmm. as individuals, as the federal government, as world economies were concerned, state and local governments. And as a result, the fact that we were in a lot worse condition whenever we hit this one, the results were going to be more troubling than they were the last time around. And as you're aware, you know, the 2008, we, we barely survived. I mean, yeah. it uh, took a massive government bailout, and uh, fortunately that uh, managed to keep us afloat. But um, you know, it's more troubling this time, you know, where we are right now. It, it, you know, we, I know you're familiar with fiscal policy, monetary policy. We're going to talk about what people might do, what they can think. Uh, you know, we're going to be honest. Um, there are going to be some people hurt by this. We're not going to sugarcoat it. But uh, let's, let's go back and, and, and uh, let's talk about, first of all, what was really interesting, Ted, is I've interviewed two very important people in 401k. The first person I interviewed was you, because you are the father of the 401k. And then the second person I interviewed that I know you know who this guy is, is Richard Stanger. And uh, Richard Stanger, for those who don't know, is the guy that penned the legislation. So he was four years out of Temple Law School in his, in his 20s. And Conable Barber, or Barber Conable, I can't remember, the, the legislator up in New York, he had relationships with Kodak and Xerox, and they wanted uh, some of the deferral benefits that were in ERISA. And Carter was struggling in his presidency. He'd failed in energy. He failed in Iran with hostages. He was trying to pass a tax bill. And so when you get attacked the box bill, all this special interest comes in. And they hired Richard Stanger, this young lawyer out of Temple Law University. And the legislation originally originally was under 1,000 words. Now, this is something I don't remember if I shared with you or not, Ted. But this is where I think the vision he had and the vision you had are polar opposites. I like your perspective on the following. When they ran that legislation, they knew that it was going to affect the tax code. And so the Treasury Department said, look, we've got to run an analysis on this to see how a 401k would affect revenues because it is a tax law. And so they went through all, the, all this. And, and Ted, I've got to tell you, when Richard told me this, I about fell out of my chair. He said, Andy, we've, we've put that legislation out in front of them. And they came back and they said at the, at the origin that they thought that the impact of this legislation would impact tax revenue less than a million dollars a year. And I, I fell out of my chair. And, and yeah, said, and he, Andy, didn't uh, he didn't see it, but yeah, there, you did. Well, well, the re- reason for that is it was passed for a very different reason than what we know it today, and we don't have time to go into that. But let me play off this a little bit. Please. Um, you know, I, um, what I came up with was adding the matching employer contribution and for employees to be able to put money in pre-tax. Yes. And when I came up with those pieces and that was, you know, that was in the fall of 1979, you know, this had passed in, in eight and 78. Right. And uh, so at the time I realized immediately that this had big, big potential. And as a result, that was when Ronald Reagan had won his first term as president. Right. And his, his big uh, domestic effort was to increase savings and capital formation. And the way he was going to do that was by making IRAs available for everybody. That was going to be the vehicle. Right. And the guy spearheading that uh, legislation was Jack Kemp. And I met with Kemp at the time and said, hey, look, there's something out there you guys don't know about that's going to be a lot bigger than this expanding IRA will ever be. And according to my calculations, it's going to be costing you billions of dollars of revenue within five years. Now, that that 
input to him got ignored. They went ahead and you know passed legislation to make IRAs available to everybody. Then, then we had the Tax Reform Act of Ronald Reagan, where he, uh, his administration proposed killing 401k yes. because it was costing too much lost tax revenue. Yes. We had a big we had a big fight on our hands to keep 401k from getting killed altogether. You know the, the what what was interesting is is as you looked at this as you know you were you were brought in in the fall of 1980 to help uh, I think it was. Uh, uh, Cheltenham Bank uh, redesigned some stuff, and uh, and you were looking for solutions. So you were looking at this at a, a kind of a unique, you know, kind of a genius lens. And uh, this was the problem that that you were going to solve. And I'd like to read a, a passage from your book, if I could. Two things. It says, well, the potential problem. There was a potential problem because four hundred and one k tied the amount uh, that the highest one third paid employees could put into a plan to the average percentage of pay that the lower two-third paid put into the plan. You say, I had major doubts about how many of the lower uh, two-third would be willing to put in a bonus uh, to be invested for retirement rather than using the money for goodies. So let's go back to two things. The original 401k section did not contain a reference to employer contributions. That was your idea to make it work. Can you talk about how that stroke of, of, of inspiration came to you, said, look, if we match this, we'll have something, but it also gave the problem of, you know, you have the bank president with one bonus, you got the bank teller with another. Can you help people understand the employee match and understand the dilemma of the bank president probably being excited about deferral, but the teller not? I think that's a key part of what, that was really a turning point I felt that when you figured that out, that allowed, that gave this life, I believe. That's the moment it really had life. Do, do you agree? First of all, I don't want to put words in your mouth, um, but could you talk about that idea so people can get context? Yeah, yeah, you, you got it right, Andy. Um, yeah, the marginal tax rate at the time was around 70%. Yeah. So, you know, if you were somebody in that tax bracket, and you didn't have to be earning a million bucks or whatever to be there, you know, a hundred thousand dollars or so, uh, you know, you were pushing up into that level. 70% so if you got a $10,000 bonus yeah. and half of it or 70% of it went to federal income tax, you know, that, that wasn't a great deal. Defer. So, yeah. you know, so just, uh, getting those individuals interested in doing something pre-tax wasn't hard. Now, you know, if you take the average teller giving up a, a you know, $500 bonus and saving maybe 50 bucks in taxes to have that invested for retirement, that wasn't going to be terribly exciting. So that was why I um, said, look, we, we need to up the ante. And uh, a way to do that was to say, well, in addition to a tax break, you're going to get additional money as a match, you know, from the bank if you do this. And, you know, where that came from was there were already in existence these after-tax thrift and savings plans where employees put money in after tax and got a match. And we had one of those in, you know, in our little company. So, you know, I was familiar with that concept, but the key here, there wasn't anything in this piece of legislation that was uh, written by Stinger. By the way, I was a Temple math major. Oh, really? You <laughs> so and, Temple University you played a big me. role here. There's no <laughs> way that, the, you gotta be kidding me, the guy that wrote the legislation, the guy that made it fly, are both Temple University. I did not know that. Learn something new, that's something else. Do you know, do you yeah. know Richard? I do not. Okay, just wondering. Nope. Yeah. He's, he's as yeah. delightful so, as you are, he's a great guy. Yeah, so, so anyhow, um, you know, the, the, that's where the uh, the match came from. But there wasn't anything in Stringer's legislation that said you could do that. Now, the other huge piece, which was even a bigger deal that occurred to me, was, hey, we could use this for employees to be able to take part of their pay and potentially contribute it pre-tax to this, using this section of the code as well. And that was uh, more questionable, you know, whether that was going to be permitted or not. We're speaking with Ted Benna, the father of the 401k, the author of the book, 401k, 40 Years Later. It's available at Amazon.com. And luckily, it's also available in a Kindle version because 
under coronavirus uh, problem we're having, Amazon is is curtailing. I know that I've got a couple of books I've written, Ted, and I got a message from uh, our distributor Ingram saying that uh, you know they got to they got to send out the mass, they got to send out the essentials, and so good thing that you've got a Kindle version that people can pick up, watch on their Kindle or or uh, in the Kindle software. Four K four years later by Ted Bennis. So, you know, here we have this legislation that uh, Richard Stanger writes uh, that he thinks is going to be small. You've had the vision. I remember you said, you know, hey, you knew it was going to be big. Maybe not, you know, the trillions big that it is, but you knew it was going to be big. But at that point, you know, once you started this, it caught on like wildfire. At that point, it's kind of like when this thing, like I didn't have a problem with 401ks at all because pensions had their own problems. Like everyone says, oh, it killed pensions. Well, what if you quit your job? Now you lose your pension. They weren't, you know, transferable. And by the way, if you work for the Studebaker company, pensions weren't going to be paid if the company went out of business. And right now, if you're a school teacher in Kentucky, you know what I'm talking about as far as you know, how, how much you trust other people to run your pension. So it wasn't like pensions were these, you know, golden, wonderful years. There were a lot of problems with pensions, and we could go on with that. And the 401k was another alternative to that. There were, if you quit your job, it was, you know, you could roll your 401k over, you could take the money with you, rather than trusting, you know, Kentucky legislators that would that put the money in New York hedge funds and lost it all through fees, you could at least try it yourself if you had the education. So at that point, it's kind of out there and you're just watching it go like everyone else. And then now where I do have a problem with 401ks and I am vehemently in attack mode is Wall Street looked at this and said, my gosh, people are gonna be contributing on autopilot. Hey, let's jack up some fees. Let's make some money. Shouldn't surprise anyone listening that Wall Street saw this idea and their fangs came out and they said, we're going to we're going to take fees on this. Could you and, and, and this is where I think this is important, where I want to read from your book, because I think this is an opportunity for you to gain some clarity on where you stood when this fee stuff started happening. And I'm going to quote from your book. It's a long quote, but I think it's important to get your message out because I I get taken out of context once in a while, too. So here it goes. This is Ted from from uh, 401k four minutes later. I have learned that I have no control over what will appear in print when I agree to be interviewed by the editor of a publication. Any small segment from a long interview can be utilized by the writer however he wishes. You have to live with this fact or never do media interviews. Some of you have probably read the article in which the quote, father of the 401k says he would blow up 401k and start over, unquote, article. That interview and that catchphrase went viral in today's technology because the writer misunderstood one of my points taken from a long interview. I was addressing investment structure and high fees typical of 401k today rather than the whole 401k system. So would you talk a little bit about how you got taken out of context, what you meant by blow up, and, 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 the, and where you and I are in very close alignment is we're not a big fan of the Wall Street fees and, and how they work on this. Put your, this yeah, is, just to, this, to this build chance, around that. Yeah, this is your chance um, to be interviewed and not be, and, and I won't edit this, okay? You tell, them, you tell <laughs> sure. us how it is, Ted. Yeah, well, to kind of build around this uh, couple of points, really. Uh, 401k turned the mutual fund business into what it is today. Yes. It was you know, it was a little mom and pop operation, you know, prior to 401k. And uh, so what happened, uh, you know, I've covered in the book in detail the, the history of fees. You know, we went from in the beginning where the administrative fees were being paid by employers. And then I explained the history in, in the book of how employers move from that into what were known as bundled arrangement, where yeah. what got bundled were all the fees, and right. they got dumped on participants. That was the first thing you know that happened. Uh, the next one is then there we got a sec another layer of fees later on that was dumped on top of many of these plans to provide what is known as investment advice. Yes. So we got wrappers around and another layer of fees, and you know we went from where. Initially, uh, you know, big companies were running these plans at a cost of, you know, 10 to 20 basis points 
cost to participants, and that ratcheted up. Uh, you know, into two, three hundred basis points. I mean, gigantic yeah. increase. Uh, so that's that's kind of some of the general history. And so it was that part, and then the other of making these too complex in terms of the investment decisions participants had to make, which is what I was talking about of blowing up and starting over. You know, from scratch, from you know, we were where we were at that time, which I think would have been a good thing. You know, on the one side, it's interesting because people, you know, there's always two sides of a coin, right? There's always two sides of a coin. So on one hand, you can say, well, was the four hundred and one k a mistake? And then you have to say, well, it helped people save, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars that it wouldn't have saved other way. So how do you call that a failure? On the other side of the coin, it, it all it is all about those fees because. The most important word on Wall Street is assets under management. So other people are going to say, well, actually, Ted, yeah, I might have helped these people say, but what he also did is he created an asset of trillions for Wall Street, in which they get to collect these fees from, whether it goes up or down or sideways without taking any risk. So that's kind of, you, uh, listeners are going to have to decide for themselves what they think. But here's, I didn't, I'm not an actuary of Brent. I never even took one test. I barely passed math. So I, I did a spreadsheet. And uh, I looked at the difference over a person's working life at paying fees of 2.5% and then paying fees of like 0.75%. I'll let you take a, a shot at this better than I am. What do you think the impact is on someone's 401k with you know John, the late John Bogle's compounding cost idea? You know, what's the difference in a person's 401k from maybe 0.5, 0.75 basis points uh, to maybe, you know, two, two and a half percent of that money going to the Wall Street. What's the difference in your mind? Probably uh, from numbers I've generated also, uh, something in the range of seven to 10 additional years of retirement income, you know, that are lost uh, by those uh, I mean, exorbitant fees. I mean, this is tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars. The difference, seven years of income they take from you if the fees are too high. I think that's what I, that's that's the part you wanted to blow up. Yes, that's the part that was the issue. Yes. Well, that and then just the complex uh, moving this from something very simple investment wise, where you had two options, you split in twenty five percent multiples to to twenty five, thirty, or more options you had to choose from, and you were supposed to be smart enough, you know, to know how to make those kind of decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, t let's talk about smart enough to make those ty types of decisions. So you know that uh, you and I are both somewhat advocates. Um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a financial education advocate. I really believe that it's difficult for people to navigate waters. And I don't believe we teach financial education in school. You know, I, I was a horrible student. Uh, you know, I was kind of a dumb kid and had my head screwed on backwards most of the time. But I really want one of the classes I wish I would have taken is, you know, how do I learn about assets? And so I studied it myself and kind of self-taught, which it has its risks as well. But I, I've got to tell you, one thing I'm grateful for is I look at the market today. You know, we've had circuit breakers drop. Let me give you one example, Ted, of just one position I'm in. So I, uh, I wanted to buy some Exxon Mobil and I saw it get down to 55 I saw a correlation between the price of oil, you know, falling below $40 a barrel and Exxon at 55. And I, I, uh, I made a promise, collected some premium on a put option, made a promise to buy at 55. And so I got paid a little money to buy at 55. Well, I didn't know that the Russians and OPEC were gonna start a fight. And I didn't know coronavirus was gonna land or drown all the planes and that we we're gonna have $20 oil in three weeks. I didn't know that. But one thing I did know how to do, Ted, is I knew what a protective put option was. And so I bought, and I spent about $5, expensive put, it's, it's, it's good till June, but I bought a put option at that 55 strike. What that means is, is I can force someone to buy that for me at 55, no matter how low it goes, clear till June. And that means instead of losing, you know, right now Exxon Mobil's in the 30s, instead of losing $20 on that, I lose about five bucks and my new cost basis will be wherever it lands. Now, that's a very complex thing for someone that doesn't know it. But it's like, why not learn what a put option is today? And you could hedge all this stuff and this systemic risk. So I remember asking you this question. I think your answer hasn't changed. I said, you know, Ted, in addition to the 401k or however you're investing, 
Is there a place for financial education? Do you think it should it be taught? I believe your answer was, well, Andy, the answer is yes, 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 and yes. Um, how has your financial education helped you uh, in this crisis? Because you're in that age group now, 40 years later, where you know, you've got your ranch and you've got some other investments outside of 401k. How is retirement looking for you and what do you see uh, in terms of people that were educated versus not? I, I guess my greatest education, probably in the investment side, Andy, was the mistakes I made rather than oh. the uh, the right decisions I made. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you, know, you know, those we um, definitely are part of the learning process, and you know, the key. Hopefully, you do that when you're young enough. Yeah. And you do you, you do learn, and uh, probably the other thing uh, I would say is you know is to broadly diversify as much as possible. Uh, you know, not just certainly in stocks and bonds and, you know, uh, other types of assets as well. It's not an, it's not easy. It's not simple. See, One of the things that's you know, bothered me recently and why I'm not shocked about this downturn is there's been a lot of focus, again, on 401k millionaires, right? Yeah. yeah. Lots of articles about that. And I told my son, uh, you know, that that's troubling because... The last time before it blew up, I was getting a lot of calls from financial writers saying, do you know any 401k millionaires we'd like to interview them? And, you know, the concept there generally that's promoted is, oh, this is pretty simple and easy. You know, you put a little money away, you make, you know, good investment or two, and before you know it, you're a millionaire. And uh, we, we both know it's not that not that simple, definitely. No. It's a lot more complicated. Getting good professional help certainly helps uh, a lot as well. You know, if people, I wish, I wish I could rewind and screw and play. I wish the interview and I had in, last summer uh, could have been played for everyone because you have credibility as the father of 401k. And I remember we talked. You said you know you diversify beyond stocks and bonds. And I remember at the time, I think you were painting your ranch, and you said you know we bought this as an investment to diversify out of not only having stocks. And, uh, you know, your wife likes horses, and so you, you got some horse on there. I just remember you telling people, hey, look, the people who got killed in 08, if you're 20, you're going to be fine. But the people who are 50 or 60, you know, you can't recover for something like that. And that's when you said, you know, Andy, if this happens again uh, and people aren't ready, it's not going to be a pretty picture. It's going to be tough to... Uh, you know, for those guys to cover. I wish they would have heard our interview and what you had to say uh, back then. And I'm sure some people uh, listened and, and I'm sure uh, some people didn't. Uh, two more things that I've taken up my time with you. And, and again, well, and, and should we got just stop you on that? Yes. I, I did cover that in the 401k 40 years later book yes. and, uh, you know, in detail and was 18 years ago, but it's one thing else in, I'm sorry, 18 months ago, but it's one thing else in there that's, that is important now, uh, and that is reasons why if you're in a pension structure, you, you know, whether it's employer-sponsored or uh, you know, uh, state, local government, whatever, Calpers, you have yeah. the opportunity to get your cash out of that. You, know, you should be doing that, keeping it liquid, and then once this thing just burn itself out, you'll do the kind of investing you know, you're talking about, Andy, where Hey, hey, when you've got a 50% or 60% or no discount, right time certainly then to be buying stocks, but, you know, use some of the uh, protective uh, means you have, you know, whenever you do, do that as well. Yeah. Yeah, it, you know, the protective put's a good place for people to Google and start. What's a protective put? I mean, I Ted, I didn't know the future. I Look, if I'd have thought ExxonMobil was going to be at 32, I wouldn't have bought it at 55. But I did buy it at 55, and so I bought insurance, basically. And to me, that's an easy concept. I insure my home against fire. I'm sure you insure your home against fire, not knowing if it will burn down. But, you know, if you look at where people hold their wealth, it's in their retirement accounts and in their homes. That's what the census says. And people insure sure the heck out of their homes but very few people have insurance on their 401ks they don't have insurance on their investments and they don't know how to hedge and that's that education piece last thing uh i'm, I'm going to share uh the book is for 401k 40 years later available on amazon kindle get it now read it you can learn about this 401k and the history of it and what the guy who really put it out there and invented it you know what has to say about it 
You talk about something in the book that I like to finish with. Last time we we uh, you didn't really plug your books. You uh, plugged a, a Christian organization, a charity that is important to you. Would you just just give people details on uh, we we kind of sent people there before. Talk about that Christian charity for just a second. What's that charity that you enjoy? Christian yeah, well, thanks, International, uh, and yeah. it's uh, Compassion International, Compassion and International. Uh, yep. you know they are. Uh, the largest organization probably in terms of providing support to high risk children and, you know, and all other people, uh, you know, uh, getting, trying to get uh, young ladies out of sex trafficking and a whole host of things. And, uh, you know, they're um, really a super organization. I've known a couple of the board members, you know, extremely high percentage of the funds they collect, you know, are applied uh, hands on, you know, rather than to paying administrative expenses. So thanks for the opportunity. Well, and and I thought when we talked before, I thought, well, isn't that isn't that great? You know, most people that come on, they they plug their website, plug this, you know, whatever. And I thought, well, Ted didn't even say, Andy, I don't really care about my books, just plug this charity. And so when I when I said, okay, Ted, I'm going to be the first guy to buy your book when it comes out this fall. I don't know if I made it first, but I didn't buy it. And you you really reveal, and you're very vulnerable, and you talk a lot about that side of you that you're a man of prayer. And it was interesting how you've talked about the inspirational side of going through this and the spiritual side of going through this. And, and so I thought, you know, people should know that there's that, that not everyone that, that deals with money and finance is this cold hearted, you know, burger meister, meister burger, who, who is, you know, Mr. Potter, that you're a man of faith and you're a man of prayer and uh, you're a man of love. And I'm, I'm going to throw this out there and, and see if you'll uh, endorse this idea, Ted. Right now in this world and in our country, people are worrying about what to buy. Should I buy gold? Should I buy food? Should I buy toilet paper? Should I buy stocks like Andy is? Should I buy real estate? What should I buy? And I'm going to submit, Ted, with a little lump in my throat that, uh, you know, from where we are right now, our greatest asset might be our neighbors, our community, and each other to, uh, to come together and fight this thing off, get it through, and get it through as fast as we can because the guys that, you know, the guys that are 20 and put money in their 401k, well, they'll live another day. But these guys that are 65, 60, 58, you know, we don't want this dragging on for those guys. So uh, greatest asset isn't money right now. Greatest asset is uh, is our neighbor and each other. Would you buy into that one, Ted? Well, I certainly would, but also I'd like to just say the most important part of that to me actually you know, it is my faith. And uh, last fall, Andy, I was invited to uh, up to New York City by the Wall Street Journal to participate in their Future of Everything event, which is, yeah, it's a big deal. I mean, they've been yeah. doing it for a couple of years now where they bring together, you know, what they consider to be kind of the, the brightest, particularly youngest people in the country, you know, to discuss and present creating new ideas, you know, what the future is going to be. And, you know, I had the opportunity uh, during lunch to sit with a table full of those individuals, you know, before doing my presentation. And the two things that I walked away from there that really stood out to me, the first was the fact that, you know, they were discussing, and I won't get into specifics of how, you know, different ideas were going to do such wonderful things. And, and, and I had an opportunity, I said, well, my biggest concern about what's going to have the biggest impact about our future is the next meltdown yeah. <laughs> economically. Yeah. And they were, they were like, what's this guy talking about? You know, I mean, it was, it was astounding. You know, I was like, how could that, you know, I mean, he's got to be crazy, you know? And the other thing I walked away from that session from was there was absolutely no sensitivity to the fact that there might be somebody bigger out there that controls things rather than us. Interesting. Great, great comment, Ted. And I know that there's millions of people that, uh, that, that share in that. And uh, I'll tell you, if there's, if there's a power there that can help, uh, boy, I hope we get it because that's what we need right now. So, Ted... Uh, we've taken our time. You're such a gentleman. You know, I, I wrote a book, you know, that was critical of a lot of the 401k because of some of the issues you and I share on it. 
And, uh, and so I thought, you know, I thought, will Ted even be interviewed by me? You know, is he going to, am I just going to, you know, attack him? No, it's the fees. It's wall street. It's a lot of other things that I have issues with, uh, Ted, you're a gentleman. I wish you your health, your blessing and, uh, you and Ellie, you stay safe, uh, out there in the East. I'll hold things down here in the West. We'll band together. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll serve, we'll pray. We'll get this through this thing, right? All right, Andy. Yeah, thank you. Can't thank you enough. I hope you enjoyed our time with Ted Benna, the author of 401k 40 Years Later. He is the individual that looked at that tax legislation and said, you know what, we could spin this into a retirement program and apply that. Uh, if we tweak a little thing here and a little thing there, Wall Street took a hold of it and it just continued to morph. The reason I think this in- interview is important, and I'm so grateful for Ted uh, for coming on. You know, I, I, again, I wrote a book that was very critical of 401ks. I pulled no punches in how I feel about it. And for him to come on uh, and, and give his perspective, uh, very, very grateful that he would do that. Uh, a couple of ideas, a couple of things I'll just mention here at the close of the uh, podcast. Uh, if you want to Google this, you can. Uh, you check out uh, Vanguard How America Saves. There's a PDF they put out every year that talks about the contributions that people make to their retirement programs. There's in, in that, uh, it's 2019, they haven't done 2020 yet. So this was done at the height of the market, right? It was done at a time where the, we had all time highs. And if you go through there, you can, you know, there's a ton of data, but skip down into page 052, 53, 56, somewhere in the 50s, you'll see a little diagram that breaks down how much people have by age. Now, in 401ks, there used to be, until this last two weeks, there used to be about $7 trillion in the United States in contribu- defined contribution plans. And Vanguard has a large section out. They have about 1.4 trillion of the uh, of the seven. So that's a pretty good sampling. And in that uh, in that report, it says that when you go to a person who is uh, 55 to 65 years old, those staring at retirement in the face, 55 to 65, the mean balance uh, in those accounts, meaning the person in the middle, is about sixty thousand dollars. Right around there, you know, 60, 62. That means that half the people in Vanguard, age 55 to uh, 65, have less than $62,000 in their 401k. Imagine trying to live in retirement, 55, 65 with 60,000. After this market is through with it, we don't know what number number will be. Right now we're down, you know, 30, 30 plus percent. Um, So you got to take, you know, uh, 20,000 out of that. Now they got 40. And, uh, you know, I don't know that these guys have time to recover. We don't know how this time uh, is going to recover. One of the things I talked about in my book that I had an issue with 401ks was something called the systemic risk, where people weren't going to be educated to take the measures for personal protection and hedges in investing, but they would... uh, they would just you know wait for it to go down and up and ride it out. That's great if you're 20, maybe. But even those guys uh, before at the height of the market, they only had about $60,000. So that's why I was a little critical of the 401k. I certainly couldn't be critical of Ted, though. It's a marvelous history. There's more to every story. Read his book, get his side of it, and uh, don't take my word for things. You know, you can call me fake news if you want. Uh, I would be thrilled if if everyone listening to me fact-checked this on their own. Boy, if you if we became fact-checkers, how awesome would that be uh, where you say, nope, Andy's giving out fake news. He's not telling the truth. I would love it. If you guys uh, became fact checkers and and learn, because our whole thing here is uh, we're advocates of education. We're not telling people what they should and should not do uh, other than advocating to uh, put more financial education in schools, uh, have parents uh, teach their kids and uh, just a greater awareness of the need to, uh, to learn a little bit more about money. Uh, I know I'm certainly not an expert, uh, any stretch of imagination. I'm just a student just like you. But we thank you for tuning in. And we're going to increase the frequency of our podcast now. Uh, I think people want information uh, more than ever. So we're going to do our best to increase the frequency and put out information. And we hope mostly that it's helpful for you guys. Stick together. Uh, I think right now your greatest asset, uh, like we said on the podcast, is each other. And so uh, band together uh, as a human family. Let's get through uh, this tough, tough time. You've been listening to the Cash Flow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner. 
For more information on investing made easy, go to thecashflowacademy.com.